Imagine being away from your home, from all that's familiar to you, from those you love, for an extended period of time, and then finally getting to come back home. Growing up, a movie that my brothers and I loved to watch was Homeward Bound The Incredible Journey. It follows three animals, Chance and Shadow the dogs and Sassy the cat, as they travel across part of the country to find their owners, and the beautiful reunion that they have together at the end of the movie. Stories of families being reunited after weeks, months, or years apart are feel-good stories, ones that tug at the heartstrings. Speaking from personal experience, being reunited with family after being separated for a long period of time is beautiful and magical. And it's also the beginning of another journey. One that is sometimes as difficult, if not more so, than the initial separation. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for the rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when the sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water, in a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it to the coastlands far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. In our focus text, we hear the story of the joyful return of those who have been exiled. So they've been in exile in Babylon for 70 years before they return to Israel. 70 years! That's a long time. That's the amount of time that Queen Elizabeth II was on the throne of Great Britain. That's six years less than the average lifespan of someone in the U.S. It's about the average lifespan for the Israelites back during the time of ancient Israel. So those who were living in exile. Which means that unless you were an infant at the time of the exile, you probably have never seen Israel before. And if you had, you're probably way too little to remember it. So those who were coming back to Israel, these exiles that were coming back, they were the children and grandchildren of those who had been forced out of their homes, forced to leave Israel and move to Babylon. They only knew the stories that their parents and grandparents had told them about their ancestral land. Jeremiah writes that God will lead them back. They shall sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall rejoice and dance. Their mourning turned to joy, their sorrow to gladness. And it's a beautiful image. It's also very complex. 
knowing that those who are returning are the second and third generations of those who had been exiled, what exactly were they mourning? Was it the idea that their loved ones who were taken from their homeland were not able to return like they were? Is it mourning the loss of all that they know, being brought to a new land that's unfamiliar to them except through stories? Because they were born in Babylon, so for them, they were leaving all that they knew. Were they mourning having an idea of what Israel would be like, only to arrive and find that it's not the same, it's changed since their parents and grandparents were gone? I'm not sure. But I do know though, that it's complicated. It's complicated to be taken from where you were comfortable, put in a new situation, and then get used to that new situation, be longing to go home still, only to go home and find that things are different than you remembered them. Sure, some things remain similar, but other things change. Not only that, but you've also changed. Your loved ones have changed. And that's uncomfortable. It's hard to grasp and it's hard for other people to understand if they've never been through that. For those who were returning from exile, they may have very well felt like they were foreigners in this new land. They were excited to go to Israel, but they were kind of lost, trying to figure out their footing, feeling sadness about what they had left, maybe a little worried and a little fearful about the future. I wonder how many of us have felt like that at some point in our lives, where we're, we're expected to be happy about new opportunities, about where we're at. We're expected to be settled in right away. We're expected to start moving forward as if nothing has changed for us, when in fact everything has. And we just can't. We're just not there yet. You know, we want to be, but we aren't. It, maybe it's changing jobs. And while the change that you're making is good and it's necessary and you're excited about it, the change is also hard because it means meeting new people, figuring out a new system of doing things, and at the same time mourning the things and people that you enjoyed from your previous job. And it can be a little overwhelming. Now, substitute a new job for, gosh, pretty much anything. Moving, going to a new school, starting college, graduating from college, getting married, pretty much any other change, put that in that scenario and you'll see that it's not always easy or roses and rainbows to make a change, even when the change is necessary. Now the thing is, it's okay to not have it all figured out. It's okay to be working through a lot of emotions while still being in the place that you should be while still making that change. It doesn't mean that change is bad. It just means that it's sometimes scary, sometimes overwhelming, sometimes a lot. And so it's not about being afraid to make a change in the first place. It's just being okay with the fact that you're probably not gonna be on your A game right away. So the gospel in all of this. Multiple times in this passage, Jeremiah writes that God is walking with them. God leads them back to their ancestral land. God gathers Israel to him. God redeems them. God comforts them and gives them gladness for sorrow. God loves them with an everlasting love and promises them bounty. And for us, it's a promise that even though change is hard, we aren't alone when we're walking through it. 
It's a promise to us from God that even with mourning, there's still joy. And even with sorrow, there can be gladness. Even with uncertainty, there's hope. Hope is that belief that tomorrow will be better, that joy and dancing can come from mourning, that gladness can come from sorrow. Hope helps us move forward, even when we're in a place of darkness or a place of waiting. Scottish author Samuel Smiles wrote, Hope is like the sun, which as we journey toward it, casts the shadow of our burden behind us. Hope is what sustained the Israelites as they were in exile, telling the stories of their homeland to their children and their grandchildren, so that one day, even if they could not see their beloved land again, their children and grandchildren might. Hope that even if things had changed drastically for them, there was still the promise of new life for future generations. And that hope was similar for those who returned from exile, their descendants, because those descendants had hope and the hope led them back to Israel, even with the fears that they may have had, even though they were leaving all that they knew in Babylon behind, even though they were unsure of what they would discover or what their lives would be like in the future. That hope brought them home. It is okay to fear the unknown to not emotionally be in the place where you or others think you should be. It's okay to struggle with finding your equilibrium after returning from an exile, whether that exile was long or short, self-imposed or not. And it's okay to mourn that which has changed, even if the change is for the better. It's also okay to have hope in the midst of all of those other emotions and thoughts. Hope that the world will be better, that change can happen, that mourning can be turned into joy and sorrow to gladness, that you will be able to be merry and rejoice in the dance. These are the things God promises us. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. So a couple of reflection questions for you to take with this week and go deeper into the message. The first, is it difficult for you to have hope? If so, what makes it difficult? And if not, why is, does it seem easy? And the second, what is it that brings you hope?